what is the labor theory of value? And actually before that, yeah. what is value? Is that, um, this is like me asking what's happiness. Uh, is there something interesting to say about trying to define value? You vary, and this is a, a huge problem in economics, is arguments over what does value mean? And the neoclassicals came down and said it's subjective. It's value is whatever you get out of it. It's, it's your personal evaluation of something, your personal feelings. So they've got that very subjective idea of value. Whereas the Marxists, and the, being inherited as the classical school, talk in terms of objective value. So the value is the number of hours it takes to make something. Or the effort. The value is value is the effort that goes into making something in the yeah. classical school. Well, that's just like one measure of objective. Where do you fall? Huh? Where, where do you fall? I fall. I, I, I fall on versus uh, subjective versus objective spectrum. I think you value. have to, you have to have the capacity to, to to move between one and the other so in the a cake, structured cake way. Model of value. Yeah. Well, my my base model is the objective. Okay. Yeah. But above that, as soon as you start talking, you did about the worker, for example. Uh, then you get involved in the subjectivity because a worker will be angry and justifiably so about being treated as a commodity because mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm not a commodity I'm a human being okay yeah. and that's where Marx saw political organization coming from so and that's subjective now and then when you get to money itself Marx actually said well what's the pro what's the value of money now, if you use an objective theory of value, you would say, well, the cost of money, the value of money is its cost of production. What's the cost of producing a dollar? It's about two cents. So he said it can't be. The value of money cannot be its cost of production. Or the most value, I think if I remember the phrase properly, almost is value here as it must mean the effectively uncertain expectations or subjective valuation. Uncertain expectation or subjective evaluation. Okay, but yeah. he's okay with that? He was okay with that because he could move between different levels. Because he, he had a structured foundation of this dialectical vision of, of, of foreground, background tension, uh, commodity having use value, exchange value, and a gap between the two. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about uh, machines, when you're buying stuff for production. And then at the next level, he could look at workers, worker organization, and say that's driven by being treated as a commodity when you're a non-commodity. So the basic uh, labor theory of value mm. that is ascribed to Karl Marx is that value at the base layer fundamentally comes from the labor you put into something. Yeah. And you say, well, there's some deep truth there, except he misses one fundamental point, which is machines can also bring value to the world. Yep. He was saying they don't. He, he was, he was uh, the only thing that matters is human labor, not not yeah. labor. How do you measure what's the role of the, uh, whatever value machines bring to the okay. world? This is, uh, this is another intriguing history because Marx, when he first started, had what you can call a, a an exclusivist explanation for why labor created value. What's that? And that was to say that uh, there's, uh, the labor is the only commodity with both what he called commodity and commodity power. So you have labor and labor power. Labor is the, and I get fuzzy about this, so I haven't read it for something like 30 years, but labor has both commodity and commodity power. The commodity is you can buy labor, which is the means of subsistence. Labor power is the capacity to work inside a factory. There's a difference between the two. Therefore, that difference will give rise to surplus. And there's no other commodity that has this essence of commodity and commodity power. Mm -hmm. So that was his exclusivist argument. In the middle of the 1857, he was um, visited by a guy called Otto Brau in his home in Chelsea. And Otto returned to Marx a copy of, of Hegel's phenomenal, I think it's called Phenomenology of Right. I haven't read it, but that's the book. And he, Marx was then at this stage reading through all the classical theorists again. And he was, suddenly he read Hegel again. And if you know Hunter S. Thompson? Mm -hmm. okay. Of course. Okay. 
you could, who doesn't know Hunter doesn't, S. Thompson? Somebody who hasn't had enough drugs, obviously. Yeah. But Hunter S. Thompson, he comes to you in a dream after you take your first pop mescaline of, or, or whatever. And, you and can, of you course, can, we've if, all. If you know your drugs well enough, you can tell, okay, he's stoned, okay, he's on cocaine. Okay, you know, well, Mark suddenly, his writing style in the middle of a book called The Grandresa completely changed. He switched from weed to cocaine. He switched from Ricardo to Hegel. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what in Ricardo, he had this exclusivist argument about labor, and suddenly, Hegel is back talking in terms of dialectics, not actually using a word, but foreground and background and tension. And then he, that's where this use value, exchange value, attention thing came from, is rereading Hegel 13 years after he stopped reading philosophy. Because made in 44, he was reading just the economists. So you're saying Karl Marx is human after all. He's he can, human. He could be influenced. I would love to have a beer with Karl for a wine. For Karl? He's Karl to you? <laughs> He's Mr. Marx to me. Uh, <laughs> Maybe Karl to me, I'm afraid, after all these years. Yeah, yeah, you've, you've had quite a journey together. So that's where, after Hegel, his interpretation of the dialectic comes and, in the form of background, foreground and background. And then on page 267 of the Penguin edition of the Grundrisse, Literally, one and, your memory. One and a half pages long footnote. It's pretty hard to forget. Because when I, when, I, when I did this, when I first read Marx way, way back when I was, uh, how old was I? 20. Okay. I tried to explain my explanation of Marx's use value, exchange value stuff to my colleagues in this philosophy discussion room at Sydney University during a beautiful summer that we are inside concrete you know, sandstone walls discussing Marx. And I went to say, look, the use value, exchange value argument can be applied to a machine. What's the exchange value of a machine? It's cost of manufacturing it. What's its use value? It's capacity to produce goods for sale. No relation between the two. There'll be a gap. A machine can be a source of profit. Mm -hmm. Now, I said that and I got laughed at. I quite literally laughed at. So when I went back to university 13 years later to do my master's degree, uh, I chose to read through and find in Marx where he first came across this insight. So I, I made a, my first master's thesis failed, by the way, and justifiably so. Okay? I was learning. I, I didn't know the level of um, academic discourse necessary. I had an advisor who didn't understand what I was writing. He got me to write for his um, new Keynesian audience, mm -hmm. and it was a mess, and it got failed. So I got rid of Did him. Did it get failed? Because, like, why do you think? It wasn't it a good thesis. It was. I didn't know the level. It was written for an audience my, my supervisor thought that I should be writing for, mm -hmm. and it was a mess. And so I met another guy, Jeff, Hart, Jeff uh, Fishburne, uh, as a lecturer at my, in New South Wales University, and Jeff was open-minded. He was not a, a conventional neoclassical thinker, and I realized I was, I'd throw out the half that Bill had got me to do, focus just on Marx, and so I decided to read Marx in chronological sequence from his very first works of economics, which are called the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. Mm -hmm. And he wrote those in a garret in Paris after he'd been expelled from Prussia. Mm -hmm. And so he decided to read uh, the, having been an expert on philosophy and regarded as the towering intellect of, of Hegelian philosophy in, in Prussia, but driven out because he was a radical. He, he ended up uh, writing a, uh, running a newspaper or being writing for a newspaper and he was reporting about the eviction of, of peasants from the forests, taking away their feudal rights. And so this is where his passion for economics and humanity came from. And he was a poet mm. as well. I mean, he wrote love poetry to Jenny von West, Westhalen. That's his first published works were pretty much in poetry. He was a rouse about. He was, you know, a, a wild character. We'd probably fight, fight like crazy, I imagine, if we met. Uh, oh, there's, over the beers? I'm I'm slightly even though I can be um I can get involved in an argument like no, nobody's business. No, really? No, really. But I'm a bit more peaceful of personality. Oh, you think Marx is feistier than you? He was feisty, but uh feisty with he could be arrogant. Like I'm uh, I've I've got an intellectual arrogance. I've yeah. come to accept that. But there's like a fundamental humility to you. Yeah. I've You're just, saying Marx is like he has ego that's a hard bit to too big ego. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm guessing. I mean, I'm, I'm never going to meet him. Well, the beard uh, says ego to me. The beard is huge. Yeah, that's 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 huge. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so th this is interesting. So you went chronologically right through his work, the development of the human being through his works. Yeah, and I was trying to find the point at which you discover this use value exchange value mm -hmm. idea, and it occurs in a footnote on page two hundred and sixty-seven to two sixty-eight of the Penguin edition of the Gundresa, which the, his notes he was taking literally not meant for publication, literally sitting at a stall inside the British Museum, I think, reading all the classical authors in chronological sequence, and then somebody throws Hegel at him, and suddenly he's talking in Hegelian terms. And he suddenly says, is not, uh, because it's whole value issues, what is value? Is it exchange value, use value? How do they relate to each other? That's what he was thinking about. And he said, is not ex uh, use value, which was left out of the classical school, a fundamental aspect of the commodity? Is there not a tension between the use value and exchange value? Just, just so we're clear, in that context, use value is kind of the subjective thing, exchange value is the objective yeah. thing. Yeah, and Marx was found a way to integrate the two. Mm -hmm. But he was focused on uh, labor being the only thing that can generate both the use yeah. value and the exchange value. But, no, if you look at the classical school, they focus on exchange value, objective. Look at the neoclassical, they focus upon use value, subjective, or they call it utility. So Marx, coming from the Ricardian tradition, basically dismissed the role of utility. And then when he reads Hegel, he's suddenly starting to think in terms of unities and exchange value and use value is the unity of the commodity. And he thinks, well, I, I can't ignore use value. So rather than leaving it out completely, which is what Ricardo and Smith does, I've got to somehow bring it in. And this Hegelian insight occurs to him. Mm -hmm. And you, it, it's remarkable. To, I really recommend taking a look at the book, even just to look at that particular page, because what it would have been is shown as a footnote, but it would have been him saying, oh, wow, and he's asterisk, asterisk, is not you know, uh, use value a fundamental aspect of the unity of a commodity? So in the notes, you see the discovery of an idea in the human and mind. And it's beautiful. The integration of an yeah. idea. And he actually writes, does this have significance in economics, question mark. And then he probably went home that night and like that 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 idea changed yeah, him. Yeah, it changed him completely. Okay. Yeah. And from that point on, his writing was completely different, but he still had this idea from the Ricardian days of saying that labor is the only source of value, using an exclusive argument to say there's something unique about labor. Mm -hmm. that explains why it's a source of value. But suddenly this insight occurs to him and he thinks, I can get a positive derivation. I can use use value and exchange value and the fact they're not related to each other as a dialectical tension to explain surplus value. And that's what he does. So he goes from a negative explanation of where value comes from to a positive explanation on that page of the Grindrisa. And he then triumphantly uses it to explain why labor is a source of value. You buy it for its exchange value, you use its use value, they're unrelated, the use value will be bigger, that's where profit comes from. Then he does exactly the same thing for machinery, about 30 pages on. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, it ha also has to be contemplated, which was not done before. This is wrote nice to himself, by the way, so it's, it's written in really in a colloquial style, that the use value of a machine significantly greater than its exchange value. He actually left out the word is. It's used, this is obviously to be a term, it, it'd be a translation into English of the German, I'm sure. I don't know, I haven't, I haven't seen the original notes. I'd love to see them. But uh, he says, he leaves out the word is. It also has to be contemplated that the, exchange, the use value significantly greater than its exchange value, i.e. that the contribution of the machine to production exceeds its depreciation. And that, was an insight which undermined his explanation for revolution. Okay, can, can you say that again? Yeah. The uh, the cost of production exceeds his depreciation? Yeah. Is that, okay, can you linger on that? I um... Well, it, what Marx argued, and you read this in Capital, and I read this in Capital when I first saw the contradiction in his own thought. He said that no matter how useful a machine is, uh, whether it has uh, took 100 hours to make or cost 150 pounds, it cannot, under any circumstances, add more to production than 150 pounds, which, in his old exclusivist logic, he could justify, and which in his, his, his post-1857 argument is bullshit. Can you steel man his case? Can we go to the mind of Marx and thinking, if a machine costs 100 bucks, it can't be ever more, bring more value than a hundred bucks. But that world. contradicts 
his previous logic. Because what he said, what he said is, uh, you have a commodity is the essential unity in capitalism. Capitalism focuses upon the exchange value, that pushes the use value into the background, and there's a tension between the two. Yeah. What that means is the exchange value of a commodity sets its price. The use value is independent. He called them incommensurable. He literally would use the word incommensurability between exchange value and a use value, mm -hmm. whereas neoclassicals make them commensurable. So he's saying exchange value and use value are incommensurable. And that normally means that exchange value is objective, like the number of hours it takes to make something. Use value is subjective, how comfortable the chair is, mm -hmm. the fact that you can sit in a chair. Uh, so that's incommensurability. But when you apply it in production, the exchange value of something is objective. It's how many hours it takes to make a machine or how many hours it takes to make the means of subsistence for a worker. The use value is also objective. You're making commodities for sale. And the worker does six hours. Six hours of work will make the, the uh, means of subsistence for the worker, but the worker will work a 12-hour day and the six hours becomes a gap. Now, that's incommensurability between use value and exchange value of labor. But when you look at what he said about no matter how long you know, it takes to make a machine or how many pounds it costs, he's saying they're identical. And that's contradicting his own logic. Well, what's, what's the use value of a machine? The fact that it can produce uh, goods for sale, exactly the same as the worker. Now, what I, in my modern reinterpretation of Marx, which brings in my work on energy, I see both labor and machinery as a means to harness energy and produce useful work. And they can both do that. In fact, they, they do it together. It's a collective enterprise. Okay, so, and we'll go to that. So there's no, there's no fundamental difference from an exchange value and use value perspective between a human and a machine. And therefore, they're using the same logic. They can both be a source of surplus, Yeah, which is what Marx contradicted because his explanation for where socialism would come from is that only profit comes from labor, profit comes only from labor. Over time, we'll add more machinery than labor. That will mean a falling rate of profit, and therefore a tendency towards socialism. And what he did in that insight in 1857 is contradict his own idea about what would lead to socialism. Well, and he couldn't cope with it. 